I think that all of us are called, gifted, full-time ministers of Jesus Christ. That's my basic view of the Christian faith, right? It doesn't matter if you're male or female, old or young. We are all one in Jesus Christ. And when we're saved, I'm going basically Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. We are all saved to serve the body of Christ. Amen? I want to remind you of the first Corinthians text that says we're gifted for the common good. Chapter 12, verse 7 and 11, each one of us. So I want to talk today specifically, and I want to do this on a personal level if I could, a practical level if I could. If I was doing a class on this, which I do, called homiletics, we basically talk about how to structure a sermon. But I am committed to a specific kind of sermon that's based on a specific kind of Bible study. And I want to share that with you. So I'm, I prayed before I've come. I hope you prayed for me before you came that the Holy Spirit would be here, amen? If he's not here, nothing significant and permanent will happen. But if he is here, and if our hearts are open, there's an opportunity for him to speak to us. Now, everything I say will not be relevant to all of you. I know that. But we are taping this for the world. And so I'm going to deal as if there are other people watching who desperately need to hear my understanding of what it means to preach the gospel, okay? Now, I want this to be a dialogue session as well. So I'm going to... Uh, teach for probably an hour, take a brief break, I'm going to come back, probably do a little more, and then I'm really praying that you will talk with me. I hope by then you realize you can trust me, that I'm not going to embarrass you, and I don't want you to embarrass me either, amen? We are the people of God trying to do it better, amen? That's what we're here for. And I thank you, thank you for, for being willing to take the time out of a schedule that I know you had other things to do to be here. We want to be used by God. We want to be effective to reach our generation that for us has seemed to have gone off a cliff. And I think the only answer is the Word of God. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> so let me tell you briefly about my experience in being called to preach. I was about 12 years old when I trusted Christ. Um, I came out of a divorced home. I was rather a shy, stuttering young man. And when God called me into ministry about 12, it really scared me. And I really just left the church for about 10 years and wandered and searched. And about 21, God got my attention. And I came back to the church and uh, came back to this calling. But I have always had that sense of uh, low esteem, um, uh, stuttering, uh, afraid of getting up in front of people. I'm not afraid now, but I used to be. Um, and that, that caused me some problems as a young pastor. I can remember um, King James was the basic text back when I surrendered to preach. But being a stutterer, why would anybody put a TH on every other word? I mean, it was just a disaster for me trying to read King James. So I, I've come into this as a reluctant servant. This was, a, uh, this was not something I really wanted to do. It was something I was fearful about. I can remember little bitty churches in East Texas. Uh, I went to East Texas Baptist College. And um, they told me, said, well, you'll preach some for your, your, your money. And I said, well, if I got to preach, I'm not coming. I mean, it was just terrifying to me. Small churches let me come on Wednesday night. And I remember still some of those godly women. They, they would always make tuna fish sandwiches on Wednesday <laughs> night. And they would say to me, Bob, you did so good. Have another tuna fish sandwich. And they got me over the fear of speaking. And I thank God for those small churches that did that for me. I hope in your life you know some young men and women who God has put his hand on for ministry. You can't imagine what your encouragement and affirmation can mean to them. And I hope you'll think about it as a ministry that even though we get older and can't do all that we used to do, this ministry can continue through calls and letters and prayers specifically for people who are called to serve the church in more professional ways. And all of us serve the church, but in, in a more vocational way. So let me talk to you about as I came into this, I had no, I, I, I ran from God all those years during youth camps and Bible studies. Bob was was gone. So I came into this with no real knowledge of the Bible except what I remembered as a Sunday school person as a child. 
And now I'm put, and very quickly I was called to be a pastor uh, in Marshall. What do I do? What do I do? And uh, I remember I wanted a text to grab me. So I would pray and pray and pray. And friends, by Saturday night at 10 o'clock, I could be grabbed by the concordance because I got to preach in eight hours and I have nothing to say. What do I do? It was terrifying trying to find what text God wants me to preach on. And I wanted lightning or a shock or get excited. And it was terrifying. It was spent most of my time worrying about what to preach on instead of knowing and studying what to preach on. And I think many of you are probably in the same category. And then even if I find it, what do I do with it? I mean, how do, how do I present this in a way that other human beings, lost and saved, can understand and respond? Now, we usually say that preaching is targeted toward decision and teaching is targeted toward information. But I really think that's a false dichotomy. I think it ought to do both. Because in a congregation, there are all levels of maturity. Some need a decision with very little information except the Spirit knocking on their heart. Others have been in the church a long time and they need information on how God wants them to live and how God wants them to believe. So uh, I think that we ought to merge this concept of preaching and teaching, and that is what expository preaching is. So I have, a, I have taken several notes. Now, brothers, sisters, I'm gonna, it's going to be like trying to drink out of a fire hydrant once I get started on this. Because this is, I'm in, I'm in this for 50 plus years now. And this is something I pray about and think about every day. So of course, there's going to be two problems. The amount of information and the vocabulary that I'm comfortable with coming out of my background, okay? So I am not going to try to use technical words, but they are going to pop out. And when they do, if, if you'll just raise your hand, I'll try to define it, okay? I do not want to get lost in terminology, amen? amen? And I want to say to you, I am honored to be here among God's gifted people. Amen. Now, many of you are pastors, and there's no difference between many of you and us, except I've had more, more opportunities for advanced education. That's the only, the only difference. And I thank God for it. But I feel a real stewardship of the, what is God has given me. And that is what I want to share with you. Now, please don't, please, please don't interpret my enthusiasm as dogmatism. I mean, you, uh, somebody said to me, Bob, we think you'll make heaven if you don't run past it. Now, <laughs> that's just who I am, okay? So don't take it in a negative sense. And please be willing to talk to me. Now, I have found of being a lecturer in a university, that I'm going to say some things that you don't agree with, that you have questions about, that you would like further explanation of. Now, if you dwell on those, you're going to miss my next five, my next five points. So don't, don't worry about that, amen? What do you do? <laughs> that was not the spirit. <laughs> that was the stand. <laughs> it's kind of like when the sound system goes, eh, that's not the spirit either. That's that dude back there in the back. Okay, so I, I want to share this openly and honestly with you. But I don't want you to think that I think this is the only way. Does that make sense? Because we are brothers as a called, gifted group. And I need another one of these, brothers. Sorry. <laughs> we, we are all called and gifted, and we are looking to how to do it better. Is that right? Amen. Now, not just me, but you too. And we know that this is going to take a cooperative effort of us struggling to think about how we do it, why we do it, and how we can do it better. Amen? Amen. Okay. So I want to come to you and say that the first thing I think about when I want to talk to a group about expository preaching is why do I believe this is a better model? Okay? Now, in my life, and I want to tell you about at least one of the most horrible sermons I've ever preached. And I say this because all of us preach horrible sermons. <laughs> if you hadn't preached a horrible sermon, you never preach. That's just the way it is. What we tend to do is we have something we want to say to our people. 
And then we go and find a text that kind of sort of could be, maybe fits that. And then we read that text before we speak, which gives us God's authority. And then we claim that what we want to say is God's word. That is absolutely horrible. What we're doing is preaching our agenda in God's name. That is an abuse of the Bible, not a use of the Bible. So all of us have done that. Here's, my, here's the worst that I can remember. <laughs> I wanted to preach that if you don't use your spiritual gift, you'll lose it. Trying to get my people more active in service, okay? If you don't use it, you'll lose it. Where do I find a text on that? Well, it's got to be the Old Testament. <laughs> so I went to Jeremiah, <laughs> where God told him, take your waist cloth, bury it in the bank of the Euphrates, and he went back a month later, and his robe was, of course, ruined and rotten. And here's my sermon. See, if you don't use it, you'll lose it. Now, I had a good motive, and I had a message that was important, but I abused the Word of God in trying to give what I said biblical authority. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? And most of the sermons that I hear, I would not disagree with the theology that's being spoken but I would terribly disagree on where they're getting that from Scripture. So that's, that's my big problem. We've got, if we say with our mouth we honor Scripture, we have to honor Scripture with our method of, of understanding it and presenting it. Amen? You and I don't have the right to change the Bible to fit our needs and wants our favorite hobby horse. And really what we're doing in America, and I'm speaking to all of us, me included, we go to one verse or one word, pull it out of context, and make it say what we want it to say. Amen or oh me? Yeah. Okay, so here's why I'm committed to expository preaching. I am... I am a proponent of what's called the common sense method of Bible interpretation. Now, this is also called the historical grammatical sense. Now, this is what I mean by that. The key to understanding the Bible is what was the original inspired author intending to say to the people of that day. Now, think with me again. What was the only inspired person in Bible study is the original author. What was he trying to say? And what protects me from me taking that and abusing it, what could the hearers, the original hearers, what could have they, would have they understood from this message? Not what I understood, not American culture, not Spanish culture, not 20th century, not 21st century, 1st century or B.C. What would those hearers have understood by these words? Now that is the key to Bible interpretation. Now I try to uh, illustrate that in two ways. So let, let me talk about why I think it's important. Interpreting the Bible or reading the Bible is like listening to one half of a phone conversation because this person is writing to a particular need, a particular crisis, a particular situation. And this inspired author is addressing that, right? But it's only one half of the phone conversation. Have you ever tried to just understand when you're listening to one half, you think you know, but really you don't? So what we have, how do we find the other half of the phone conversation? the historical setting of the original author. How does the original author present his message? Now, what I'm talking about here is literary units. Because literary units protects us from reading our information into Bible text. Now, here's the second illustration. Let's say that I found a seven-page drippy, gooey Valentine letter that you wrote in junior high school to somebody in your class. I found that 20 years later in the attic. 
And I brought it down and I read three sentences from the fourth page. How bad could I embarrass you? And you would say to me, Bob, 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 that's not fair. You got to read the whole letter. You got to know when I wrote that. You got to know when I wrote that to. Don't you hear God saying that to us? Because we do that every Sunday to his book. We pull a verse out of Genesis, a verse out of Matthew, two out of Paul, one out of Revelation, whip it together with our spin and say, God said it, God throws up over it. We say, but I got it from the Bible. A Bible that can mean anything means nothing. We're, we don't want your cleverness. We don't want your life experience. We don't want your denominational training. We want the original inspired author to speak. Amen? Amen? So the worst thing we can possibly say first is, what does that mean to you? Who cares what it means to you? I'm not trying to be ugly, but who are you? Are you an inspired author? Did you walk with Jesus? Are you a first century Christian? You are absolutely not. So we've got to go back to what were they saying to their day as the parameter for what we say to our day. Now, before I leave that, it is absolutely true that once we understand what was being said, then we need to apply that to our day with the same power. Amen? Now, here is where your life experiences. Here is where your knowledge of the congregation. Here is where your theological training comes in. This is where you can take this truth and you can apply it with effectiveness. Yes, that's certainly true. But what we're doing today is we're starting with application and trying to find a text that fits our understanding. And that is just backwards. But it is the plague of the American church. And that's why we have a denomination on every corner all claiming to be closer to the New Testament than their neighbor. Okay. So I'm going to say to you that I have got to do the historical setting. Now, what, am I, what am I mean by historical setting? You know this, just in other words. The who, what, when, where, why of the text you're looking at. Okay? Who wrote it? Who did they write it to? Why did they write it? When did they write it? And what's the main message? That's what we're looking at. That has to be done before, before you start saying, here's how I can present it with my outline. Now, I went to school at Southwestern. Uh, my first course in homiletics was there. Dr. Brown, I don't know if you remember him. And we were, we were taught to do a passage of scripture, come up with a creative title, three points, Illustrate and alliterate. Now, do you realize that's a Greek rhetorical model? That's not a Hebrew model or a first century model. That's a Greek rhetorical model. Some passages don't have three points. They just got one. Some have five, right? And what bothers me, I always tell preachers, if you want to be humbled, just ask your church what you preached on last week. Well, it was a, there was a dog in it, and he got run over. Yeah, you remember the story. You remember the poem. But what are we doing? Are we communicating poems and stories, or are we communicating the Word of God? Well, the problem is our illustrations are overwhelming the biblical content. And what people are remembering is my, my application, my life story, my understanding, and not the original author's inspired intent. Are you... I'm, I'm really trying to pop this lid off. It is a very uncomfortable lid. I've prayed a lot before I do it. And I'm praying the Spirit to let me speak to you today because many of us have and are abusing the Word of God for our own agendas. And I don't care what agenda it is. And we're doing it from a sincere understanding of what we ought to do. It's not coming from an evil heart. It's coming from a heart that hasn't been informed about proper Bible interpretation principles. So that's what I'm trying to communicate first. 
Before we can talk about expository preaching, we've got to talk about how do we interpret the Bible to even get to a place to present it verse by verse. Do you, under, do you understand where we're coming from? Okay. Now, so if, that, if that's true, and you have, only you can decide that. I mean, if you got five professors up here, you'd probably get 15 views on some of this stuff. So you're in the, this isn't the horse's mouth. This is <laughs> another part of the horse. <laughs> um, I have my opinion. I'm committed to it. Brother, there's no difference in us. We're both called. We're both gifted. We're both representatives of the gospel. We're, we're just trying to talk here without you getting uncomfortable with me. I don't want you to get uncomfortable with me. I want you to get uncomfortable with the method you're using to understand and present the word of God. Amen. We're not going to vote whether you like this. We're not going to vote if you agree with this. I'm not here for you to like it or agree. I'm here to put off a hand grenade in this place. Because I'm going home and you don't pay me. Please do not interpret my passionate delivery as dogmatism. Nor as thinking I'm right and you're wrong. I just want to aggressively, passionately, intellectually, and rationally present to you another way to do this that we're called by God to do and that one day we're going to stand before him and give an account of it. One of my professors up at Trinity Evangelical in Chicago was Walter Kaiser. You may know him. He's a famous Old Testament teacher. And he gave this illustration, scared all of us to death. He said, if you get to heaven and there are two lines and you see a lot of preachers and teachers in one line, he said, get in the other line. <laughs> because every sermon and lecture is reviewable. Do you realize, people say to me, well, let me go back. I tell people that airline pilots, professional airline pilots, take off and land thousands of times in their career, right? But do you know every time they go through a checklist to take off and to land? And what I'm going to submit to you is there's a checklist for sermon preparation and Bible study too. And I want to give you that checklist. And you say, well, those pilots have hundreds of peoples of lives in their hands. Do not you know that you have the eternal destiny of people who sit in front of you every Sunday? Amen. We're talking about eternity here. And we need to be responsible speakers of the Word of God. The second thing I would say is when we start who, what, when, where, why... I think the smart way to do this is to say, you know, if I go through a book of the Bible, several things will happen. I can do the historical setting for the whole book and not have to redo it every Sunday. And if I, if I help my people understand, they can't just open the Bible and put their finger on a verse and say, this is what God says. If I show them they've got to do that in their personal study, and if they know ahead of time what I'm going to preach on, so they can read it before they come to church, I think we come a long way of making sermons, not entertainment, but corporative worship Bible study events. Amen? Because right now, our people do not know the price we pay in Bible interpretation. They do not know the time it takes in doing this right. And they demand things of us that pull our energy and time away from the most important thing we do, which is give our people the Word of God week by week. Yes, it's important that we are protectors of the flock. Yes, it's important that we are shepherds of the sheep. But I would say your number one call is to present the word of God accurately, regularly to these people. Amen. So how do we do that? Well, if we preach through a book, I know what I'm going to deal with. And that may be a chapter. It may be two paragraphs. I, but if I tell my people ahead of time, I'm going through this book. And here's the, here's the dates. Now, don't be so dogmatic. If Christmas hits in there, don't do Jonah. The offering will fall. No, no, no. Take, take, have time. If, so, if there's a crisis in your community, 
break off of what you're doing and, and deal with it. This is not dogmatism, but it's a way to work through a Bible book. And the only way to understand an author is to read the whole book. Now, what this does for us as preachers, it protects us from just picking out the verses we like and understand. If I've got to deal with chapter 1, and chapter 1 deals with several things I'm uncomfortable with, I've got to admit to my people, you know, this is my opinion, but many people don't understand or agree this is the same. I can present mine. But if I go in there and I know there's a disagreement, but I say, the Bible says, I better have paid a price to really know that. Because it's an awesome thing to claim you're speaking for God when you haven't paid the price to know what that original author said. So it's, it's, it's crucial that we do that. I would even suggest to you, while we're just talking here, this, this is different from what you've heard, I think. I think it's better to plan a whole years of preaching you say, no, the Spirit can't work in a whole year schedule. He only works on Monday morning. And if I pick a year, then I can pick the books that I know deal with the subject that my church needs at the moment. And what I'll usually do is pick two New Testament books and one Old Testament book and schedule them out. So I know where I'm going. My people know where I'm going. They can pray, they can study before they come to church. Let me use a Sunday school as an example. I thank God that Baptists still have adult Sunday school. You call it what you will, that's what it is. It's an attempt for lay people to study the Bible together corporately. Thank God. But as a teacher, I am appalled when I go to Sunday school. And we, we, uh, we get there... And we talk about the Dallas Cowboys and grandchildren and what we ate on Saturday for 45 minutes of the hour Bible study. And then we read a verse and say, what do you think about it? We have never taught our people that Sunday school, they must prepare both in prayer and personal study before they come. And if they don't, then all they get is one person's pre-digested opinion. And I think it's fair to ask anybody who claims to speak for God, Sunday school teacher, preacher, or author, or, or lecturer, I think it's fair to say to them, can you show me in the Bible where you got that? That's not ugly. That's a fair question. And then I have the right to go and look at it myself, to pray about it, to research it, and walk in the light that I have. Amen? But I think we've got to hold our preachers and teachers and Sunday school teachers responsible. And God help me when they wait till Saturday night and do nothing more than read a quarterly. And if you think it's so, Sunday school teachers, some of you pastors know you got so busy with funerals and hospital visitation that it's Saturday night and you did nothing more than pick one verse out of a psalm and give what you think it means. Amen or oh me? All of us have done that. But I promise you, the Spirit is not pleased with that approach to gospel presentation. It's going to take some prayer. It's going to take some confession. It's going to take some preparation. It's going to take some retraining. And that's why I thank God you're here today. Amen. My wife and daughter have gone through this seminar that I have on my website. And they say to me, and they, they say it in love, but they say it right to my face. You have ruined every sermon we ever hear. <laughs> because they start saying to themselves, is that really what that's saying? Where did they get that meaning to that word? How does that fit with the next verse? I was on the way up here. Psalm 4610. You know this one? Be still and know that I am God. Yeah, God wants me to have a vacation on Padre Island. He wants me to sit out there in the sand. That's what he wants. That verse said it. The next verse is, the next line of that poem is, I will be exalted in all the earth. I will be exalted among the nations. And we've pulled half a verse out of a psalm to, with, to put American mentality and miss the Great Commission thrust of that particular verse. And that's typical of what we're doing in America. You just turn on any channel that has a sermon and you ask yourself, is this contextually what the original author was saying?
this is painful to me. It's painful to you. Because I know who I'm talking to. And I know the terrible price that we have paid to be who we are and where we are. But I'm afraid, brothers and sisters, we're not doing it well. We're just not doing it well. Because we're letting our day, our opinion, our denomination, our life experiences trump hard study. Now, I think you ought to tell your people when you're studying. And if you do not have a set time of study, I think that's a problem. And you ought to say to them, I'm going to be studying from 9 to 11, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Do not call me with what's the recipe for hash browns. And do not call me to go visit your cousin in prison. And do not call me, do not call me from 9 to 11, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays at the church. But you pray for me, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 9 to 11. If you want a good sermon, pray more for your pastor. Don't gripe until you've prayed. Now, if I, if I have a set time and I need to cut the phone off, tell the secretary, don't bother me, and I need to have some research tools in a quiet place, and I need to set... If you don't set the time, nobody will. Amen? You have got to be a steward of what you're called to do. One more point here, and I'm glad there are some lay people here. If you are a member of a church, you need to make sure when the annual budget comes up that your pastor has a book allowance. He needs to purchase some material to help him be a better preacher. I'm not saying $10,000, but he needs several hundred dollars every year that you say to him, Pastor, we want you to have some fresh resources. Now, who's going to tell that committee that? It's got to be you. It's got to be you. But we need to realize that we are stewards of the Word of God and that we need research help. Um, Robert, I'm a, I hope if you know some people at the BGCT, I told them I want to do a breakout section next year called Hermeneutics for Dummies. <laughs> How to use all the features of your study Bible. Because I, I, I know some of us are strapped, can't have a lot of money, but I guarantee you, if you know how to use a study Bible, every one of these principles of hermeneutics you can get from that study Bible alone. Now, most of my ministry is overseas with third world pastors who never have a chance to go to seminary, never have a chance for a conference, never. And they're called to preach. And I've got to try to help them with no resources how to do it. One study Bible can do everything you need for a historical, grammatical approach to the Bible if you know how to use it. So maybe a real good purchase would be a very good study Bible. There's some wonderful ones in Spanish and English. While I'm on this, there's only one study Bible where the translators of the text wrote the footnotes. Every other study Bible is a person's opinion or a denomination's opinion. There's only one. Now, it's going to be surprising when I tell you what it is. It's the NIV Study Bible. And because it's a dynamic equivalent translation, and many of us who are teachers and preachers, we want a word-for-word -word translation, Zondervan, about five years after NIV Study Bible came out, they adapted the notes for the NASB Study Bible. Now, those are the only two I know where the translators wrote the text at the bottom. Now, let me just say to you quickly, Bob, what are you talking about here? When I look at a text, the who, what, when, where, why become crucial. Now, how do I deal with that? Well, one of them is what is, what is the meaning of these words? Not, when I hear pastors say, Webster's Dictionary says, and I want to say, who cares what Webster's Dictionary says? This is not Webster's Dictionary stuff. This is Greek and Hebrew stuff. Now, I know most of us don't uh, fluently know Greek and Hebrew. I'm always amazed people, pastors say, yes, you mispronounce that Greek word. Like you know, fool. None of us know how to pronounce Greek. None of us have studied enough to really know that language. Get off of it. It's just arrogance and pride that we do that. But you can do this with some study helps. And one of them is... Read the Bible in one or two different translations. And there, you're going to see that words are translated differently. 
There's a wonderful book called Vine's Expository Dictionary of Bible Words where you put an English or Spanish word in and it's going to show you everywhere and the different Hebrew words that are used to translate that way and the different Greek words that are used to translate that way. You say, that takes too much time. Quit preaching then! <laughs> if you don't have time to study, you don't have a right to say God said. This isn't our deal. It's his deal. We are stewards of information. The information is available to us. We spend too much time on the golf course, in the garden, and riding our bicycles. It's a pretty serious thing to speak in the name of God to people whose eternal destiny depends on the message. It's an awesome task. Who can live with that task? Only those of us who've been called and touched and gifted can even live with it. But still, it's a responsibility for which we'll stand before God for. So we need to think about the words, how they're used. Um, when I come to this, I always think about the, the genre. I think we're going to put those books. Um, genre is a, kind of a new word for me when I first got into this. It's a French word. It simply means different kinds of literature. And uh, I remember that this little book called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Fee and Stewart. It's in Spanish, by the way. It costs $15. Well, today it may be 105 I don't know, but the inflation. But uh, I think it's about $15. You can get it used on Amazon for much, much cheaper than that. Never buy a new book. You'll get many more bang for your bucks on used books. What do you care if somebody's name's in the front? Amen? Amen. Oh, the pages turned down. Well, send them to hell. It's just a book. It's a used book. Buy the cheaper book. Acts. I'm talking to Baptist preachers here. You'll know what I say. It's one minute I say it. How many times have we been accosted by people who say, you believe the Bible? Yes. Read Acts 2.38. What does that say? Well, here we get into Church of Christ doctrine about baptismal regeneration. Acts 2.38. Or the next person who knocks on my door is a charismatic who says, unless you speak in tongues, you're just not really sure you're in. Turn to Acts chapter 4. We've got the preaching of... Uh, Philip first, and then later the apostles, John and Peter, they spoke in tongues, so that means you've got to speak in tongues. And then where do Baptists come down? We come down to Acts 16. What must I do to be saved? The Philippian jailer. Believe on the Lord Jesus. Now, friends, do you not know how much is left out of that? No repentance? No life commitment? Now, this, these are all in Acts. Acts is historical narrative. It does not tell you what should happen. It tells you what did happen. And if you go through Acts and list the people that are saved and what happens to them in order, there's not a, there's not a standard pattern. Which means Acts just record what did happen. It doesn't say this is the only way it can happen. Now once I saw that, it freed me from all this. You believe the Bible, don't you? Read this verse. See, that's what gets us. Our love for the Bible is what gets us in this proof text model of Bible interpretation. If I see you five years from now, you'll hug my neck telling you this book. And if you, how to read the Bible for all it is worth. Fee and Stewart. I'll leave it up here. I hope you'll look at it. Thank you for asking me. Now, the other one, I've been going through uh, the book of Micah on, on Tuesdays and Thursdays on a Zoom meeting with Vidal for the world. And uh, what a confusion we have in the church about prophecy. Amen? Uh, we read books that know they have it right, and it's supposed to come back in 1988, and then it didn't, and so that new book's written in 1989. Remember that whole deal? And then we got one, this is the way it's going to happen. There's going to be a secret rapture. And, oh, really? I challenge you to show me a secret rapture in the Bible. That only comes from a dispensational, premillennial perspective that has little or no biblical base. You say, ah, keep breathing. I, I can deal with it. This book has helped me more than any other book deal with prophecy. And it's got a strange title. I don't know why they put this title on it. It's called Plowshares and Pruning Hooks. <laughs> it's by a man named Sandy. If you're interested in Old Testament prophecy, 
or New Testament apocalyptic, this will open your eyes. You'll never be the same. And I hope you'll look at it. I'm going to give you an example of this book. We're looking for prophecies that have been given in the Bible and then fulfilled in the Bible and see how what was said actually is what happened, right? That's what we're looking for. So a real good one, a famous one, is Joel 2, 28 through 31, right? That's, that's the, uh, Joel's view of the end time. In Acts chapter 2, in the Pentecostal sermon, Peter quotes Joel 2 and says, Today, this scripture is fulfilled. Okay? You with me? Nothing, nothing, nothing in Joel 2 happened in Acts 2. See, we are Western literalists, and we do not understand the hyperbole and paradox of Eastern literature. And we'll split churches over it. There are churches I can't preach in because I don't have a certain millennial position. There are churches I can't preach in because I don't use a certain translation. What is the matter with us? Hermeneutics. My mother told me it has to be right. God bless your mother. But she's not authority. God bless your traditions. But they're not authority. There's only one authority for faith and practice. Right? It's not Bob. It's not Baptist. It's not bilingual. It's the Word of God. Now, how can I be a better steward of that? I know that's why you came today. I hope I'm sparking your thoughts. I I'm after you. <laughs> I'm after you, preacher, because I'm one of you. And I've walked this road painfully. Okay. Um, what else do I want to say to you? I want to talk a little bit about uh, what I think. Is there an English teacher here? <clears throat> Thank God. But uh, <laughs> um, do you remember high school where you were told that the, every paragraph has one central topic, one topical sentence, one central thought? And I think that's true. Unfortunately, there are no Hebrew or Greek markers, textual markers for paragraph divisions. So what modern translations do is say when the, when the discussion or topic changes, the paragraph changes. So I want to say to you, strongly as I know how, the smallest section of Scripture we should ever study is a paragraph. We should never study a verse by itself. Now the problem comes in King James indenting every verse. Now you know that capitalization punctuation, verse division, chapter division, none of that's inspired because none of that is in the original Greek or Hebrew text. So all of that is an opinion of, of people through the years, but they're not inspired. So we've got to go back and we've got to read, read this. Let's just say we read, I'll read a chapter. And then we want to say, what is the main truth that we're dealing with? I'm taking a chapter instead of a book. Just a chapter. Here's a chapter. What is this chapter about? Okay? And then maybe I read it in another translation. And so I say, this is what I think it's about. Then show me the verse exactly where you're getting that, okay? And then we, we say, what is, how does this truth fit in to the truth of the whole book? Because just like my illustration of the five-page letter, if you haven't read the whole letter, you don't have the right to interpret page three. It makes sense, right? If I got half the phone conversation, I don't have a right to say I understand the phone conversation. I've got to pay the price to hear the other side. Now, the other side is you read the book. Don't take Jeremiah. <laughs> Remember, I preached verse by verse through Deuteronomy in my church in Lubbock. It took me 18 months on Wednesday night. I was so glad Moses died. <laughs> <laughs> Come Mount Nebo was my theme. I was sick of Deuteronomy, I tell you what. But you know what? Deuteronomy is what Jesus quoted five times in the temptation experience. Jesus knew Deuteronomy well. Now, if Jesus knew it well, I need to... But don't start with Deuteronomy. Start with Titus or Colossians or something. Read the whole book. This is going to protect you from reading your favorite horses into it. Read the whole book. What's this book about? 
How does he present that truth? Now, this is, in a study Bible, it's the outline. The Roman numeral ones are the major literary units. The A, Bs, and Cs are how he presents it. Let's just illustrate that for a minute. Romans 118 through 331. Romans 118 through 331. It's a literary unit. First of all, I got 118 through about 320 or so is all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? And in that, I've got immoral pagans, moral pagans, and Jews. All of them have sinned. Then I got a, a litany of Old Testament texts beginning in chapter 3 where all have sinned. And then the great gospel summary, the justification by grace through faith, is right there in the next 10 verses. But if I don't see that all men are condemned earlier, then the power of those 10 verses are lost. <laughs> I can't just pull those 10 verses out without the context. Without the context. And that's, that's what I'm trying to say today and talking to you about. Now, I would need to read the whole book of Ephesians first and say to myself, what is this book about? I mean, wh what caused this book to be written? That's the first question. Who wrote it? Who did they write it to? Why did they write it? Okay, now think with me. Now, as you begin to look at Ephesians, you recognize that Ephesians is based on the same outline as Colossians. And that Colossians is written from a prison cell about some information that Paul got from a man named Epaphras who started churches where false teachers came. Now these false teachers are called Gnostics from the Greek word for knowledge. If you, this is ugly and tacky and I know it. If you know nothing about Gnostics, you cannot understand Colossians, Ephesians, and 1 John. You cannot understand it. You'll read your thoughts, your philosophies, and your doctrines into it if you do not know it's written against a heresy and every major point deals with that heresy. Now, I wish I had time, I'd go through Gnosticism. But just to say, that's an example. Now, the Da Vinci Code, that movie, last few years, based on the Gospel of Thomas, which is a Gnostic, non-canonical, non-inspired gospel. And people were calling me by the dozen saying, what do you think about this? What does this mean? They didn't know their Bible enough to protect themselves. And that's about 90% of our people. This book is written following the same outlines as Colossians. Colossians is written to the false teachers. Ephesians is written as a cyclical letter to protect and inform the churches in all of what we would call Western Turkey. Now look at your Bibles for a minute. You say, Bob, how do you know that it's a cyclical letter? Do you recognize there are no personal hellos? And if you know, there are no personal goodbyes? Very unusual for Paul. Would you look at uh, chapter 1, verse 1, where in your Bible it's going to say, to the saints, here, here's my English, who are at Ephesus. Do you have that in your Bible? Do you have a study Bible? Would you look in the margin? What does the margin say about who are at Ephesus? Somebody? Well, my New American Standard says, not in the oldest and best manuscripts. Which means, this had a blank. And every church where this went, they read, as they read this letter to the congregation, they put the name of their church in. The last big and most, the largest church is Ephesus. And somebody wrote their name in that blank. But it was a blank. And by the way, the postal route is the same as the seven letters in Revelation. Same Roman postal route. So this letter. Remember, those of you who know your Bible well, remember what there, somebody said, the letter to the Laodiceans? Remember that? Well, friends, if there is a letter to the Laodiceans, we've lost one of Paul's letters. But that is one of, one of the deals on the postal route. That's probably the book of Ephesians in transit to that church. Now, would you look at the first three chapters have three major doctrines. Each of those doctrines 
are directly against the Gnostic false teachers who overemphasize the place of the individual. Chapter 1, John Calvin's favorite chapter, predestination. Humans have nothing to do with it. Chapter 2, 1 through 10, the definitive passage on justification by grace through faith in the New Testament. Human beings have nothing to do with it. Chapter 2, 11 through 313, the mystery of God hidden from the ages but now revealed in Christ. Jew and Gentile are now one. No more slave and free. No more Jew and Gentile. No more male or female. We're all one in Christ. It's exactly against the exclusivism of these Gnostics. And then when you come, those are the three main truths and they link up to the historical background of the book. Now do you see how we could totally not see that if we weren't familiar with you've got to read the whole book first. What is the main purpose of the book? Who is writing to who? Why? And then look at the outline in the study Bible or the commentary or the Bible encyclopedia the Roman numerals are the big truths and the ABCs are how it breaks it out. Now just one more point. Look at chapter 1, verse 3 through verse 14. My New American Standard marks out as one paragraph. Does yours? However your Bible does paragraphs. Is verses 3 through 14 one paragraph in yours? Yeah. Now, the reason is this is all one sentence. These are long sentences in Ephesians. But this sentence has three, at least three main things here. Now look, if you'll follow it, the first few are talking about God the Father. Usually, in a book, Paul prays for the church. But this is a cyclical letter, so he prays to God the Father. And he thanks God the Father for who he is first. And then he thanks God the Father for sending Jesus in time. And then he thanks God for sending the Holy Spirit. And the way that I know that is the little phrase to the praise of his glory that's used three times and marks off the three persons of the Trinity. I didn't invent this. What am I trying to do? I don't want Bob to have a, a, a clever title, Seven Ducks in a Muddy Pond. You know, that's the Naaman's. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't want to have a clever title. And then Bob have three alliterated points. Oh, they sound so parallel. And then I, don't you see, I'm sticking my interpretive model on a New Testament text. And what I want is the author's outline. Let me preach Paul's outline. And how do I do that? Well, I look at the paragraphs first. And then if it's one long sentence, what is he talking about? Well, he's talking about God. Then he's talking about Jesus. Then he's talking about the Spirit. Wow, what a great sermon. Amen? And it's not Bob's sermon, it's Paul's sermon. Now this is the kind of thing we've got to do with all of these texts. I pastored in Lubbock for 10 years. And uh, I remember somebody said to me, you have neglected your people. And I said, what? They said, yes, you spend too much time in your study. And you, you just send your staff members and deacons to the hospital to visit. Now, wait a minute. What is my main job here? I get so... I punch my own button. Let me get over it. I get so mad when people in my church call me and say, Pastor, our children want to trust Christ. Will you come over? You, you can't lead your own children to Christ growing up in ev 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 You call me? You think I got a little stamp I put on their butt that says the pastor was here? It's official? What does it matter calling me to lead your children to Christ? And then you say, well, listen, I got a third cousin. Uh, he, he's in the hospital 75 miles from here. I want you to go pray for him. You can't pray for your own cousin? And then if I don't do it, the pastor just doesn't care. He's just neglecting us. We are, we are pastors of spoiled American gripey sheep. People say to me, you can't preach that. If you preach that, listen, friends. If I preach the word of God, the consequences are what they are, and that's not my choice. My choice is have I presented it what God said. Now, there's some other choices in the deal, but that's the only choice I got. And that takes some time. It takes some prayer. It takes some preparation. It takes some books. 
It takes my church praying for me. There's no way around it unless you get shallow, non-prayed for, non-studied, what I think, proof text sermons. And they're the plague of the modern church. I am going home. <laughs> My wife loves me. <laughs> Nobody can slap you except one of you. Nobody knows you except one of you. Nobody's prayed the price in those offices of crying and praying for hours, trying to understand a text to give to my people, except one of you. Now, we are responsible speakers for God. And we're going to give an account of how we've done this. All of us do it poorly. We, we, we approach this holy book with dirty hands, all of us. But we need to think about it and pray about it and try to do better as the years go by. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> I would love to talk to you. Um, I don't mind specific examples about text or about some of the concepts I gave to you or the books I recommend. I'd be happy to talk to you about anything and everything. Um, we have about 30 minutes before we eat. So would you please feel comfortable talking with me? And I will tell you exactly what I think. I yes, sir. Why pray if that knows everything? Yes, that's, that's a great question. Did you hear me say it? Why pray? If God knows everything. This is why I'm not a Calvinist. Because I do believe that intercessory prayer makes a difference in the heart of God. Now I do not understand that because I know that when I pray in God's will, I'm praying for what God wants. Why is it important that I pray for what God wants? Well, when I do evangelism, don't I pray the person would trust Christ? Don't I know God wants that? There's something about the James passage. We have not because we've asked not. So what prayer does, it's a mystery beyond me, prayer accentuates the spiritual power that unlocks heaven's gate. So we, we, can't, we can't really be effective without prayer. So I do believe, I'm praying for Ukraine right now, particularly the evangelicals in Ukraine, the Christians. Now, I, people say, well, prayer just changes you. Well, I know that's true because the best thing about prayer is that I've been with God, not that I get what I ask for. But... I am praying for God to do something thousands of miles from where I'll ever be in the next few months. And I believe that God will do it if God's people pray. So I thank you for that. And I do believe that we can make a difference. And uh, I don't know why else we pray if we can't. If it, I do not believe that our lives are pre-written puppet scripts. Now, Islam is committed to determinism, that whatever happened is the will of God. I do not believe that. I believe there are some terrible human choices that have disastrous consequences in life. So I'm not a Calvinist. Of course, my little Calvinistic joke is, you heard about the preacher who fell down the front steps of the church, broke both arms and one leg, and they took him off the hospital, and his last words were, thank God that's over. <laughs> You'll get it later. <laughs> Yes, and that's the problem. We, we say wonderful things about this book, but this book does not act as authority. Our parents, our traditions, and our denominations become the authority, right? And we have to say, even though it's painful, can you show me in the Bible where you got that? That's fair, right? Okay. May I, one, more, uh, one more ugly, tacky comment. I want you to know that the people in your church are biblically ignorant. And unless you make a concerted effort to teach them the Bible versus Baptist traditions or American culture or personal opinions, that's why we split churches over the color of the carpet and the kind of hymnal and the songs that we sing. So we have got to be responsible to educate our people. It's and they're going to react just like babies do. They're going to cry and scream. And they're going to scratch and bite. But if our job is to help them, not my opinion, to help them know the Word of God and be able to base their opinions on the Word of God, whether they fire me or not is not the big deal. And some of us will pay a price for that. I got kicked out of a Baptist church in Lubbock, Texas over guess what? 
alien immersion. I told them, I've never baptized an alien. <laughs> My view is, if somebody tells me they've trusted Jesus Christ and they've been baptized by immersion, they can belong to my church. But some group says, if you haven't been baptized by a Baptist pastor, you really haven't been baptized, then I want you to show me where that is. But you mean they'll kick you out over that? You bet your bippy they will. Of course, somebody said that shows you that women aren't in heaven. <laughs> it's a joke, ladies. Just, I think, if, here's a good example. What's happening in Baptist life? And I'm going to be really crude and rude. I know it. I'm, I'm trying to get you to think. I think Baptists are closer to the Quran than they are the New Testament when it comes to women's issues. Now, I want to tell you, I believe in the Bible, amen? And if I've got a lady named Deborah who was married but led all the tribes of Israel, and I've got a woman prophet named Huldah, which they didn't even go to Jeremiah, they went to Huldah to get the new law they found. And if I've got a lady named Phoebe who's a deaconess at the church of Sincrea in Romans 16, and I've got 16 ladies from different backgrounds listed as Paul's helpers in Romans 16, and then somebody who's a proof texter wants to go to 1 Corinthians 14.34 or 1 Timothy 2 and say, read this, the Bible says that that settles it, then I'm ready to talk about hermeneutics. So let me just do one for you real quick. 1 Corinthians 14.34, hope you'll look at it in your Bibles. If you look at that, it's not just women who are limited, it's singers and preachers who are limited in the same verse. Five verses below that it says, do not forbid them to speak in tongues and our churches say, well, that passed away. Don't you see what they're doing? I want you to look at chapter 11, 1 Corinthians 11 through 14 is one literary unit, guidelines for public worship. In chapter 11, verse 2, and you check me on this, it says, when women pray and preach in public, let them cover their head. It does not say women can't speak in the, in the collective group. It says they must cover their head. That's 1 Corinthians 11.2 verses 1 Corinthians 14.34. Now what's happening is, I guarantee you 1 Timothy 2 is a problem, but there's false teachers that are being addressed and women, some women are taking advantage in some house churches. People say to me, well, if it says it there, that's a general principle. Let me ask you a question. Are there bad drivers on the road? Did you, do you have some bad drivers, aggressive drivers, just drunk drivers, texting drivers? So is the answer to bad drivers, none of us should drive? So if I've got a group of women who probably based on the women's freedom movement in the city of Rome at the same time, probably is the source of this, Am I to deny the other texts that affirm women leadership because two texts say they shouldn't in those particular cases? Don't I have the widow's role of the pastorials where women over 60 whose husbands had died were hired by the churches? Doesn't in the second century I have the apostolic constitutions where the exact work and ministry of women's deacons is laid out? And in my Baptist church today, they say to me, look me right in the eye and say, we don't do that here. Okay, where is the authority? Your tradition or Romans 16? I get so tickled, Baptists say, yeah, those Roman Catholics, they got tradition. What's the matter with you? Change the order of service this week and watch what happens to you. Don't think we have traditions. The question is, are our traditions informed by biblical text? And not only one biblical text, but what does the Word of God? Because we believe all Scripture is inspired, and no believer, no believer has the right to let one inspired text damage or depreciate another inspired text. When, I, when, when there's a fight afterwards, you're going to fight with me because you brought it up. <laughs> yes, sir. I have the same question. Okay, let me come back here for you. Uh, some of the uh, Paul teachers teaching are directed to a local church. 
Um, I, think, I think that's true. And that would be some of these texts here. So what to say is, we understand what he's saying to a local church, okay? Then we take that truth and we have to apply it to our day with the same power. But we must be sure that how we apply it is super glued to that original intent. Yes, so our creativity comes in how we take these messages to local churches in the first century and bring them into the 21st century. And there's really no golden road about how to do that, but all of us have to do it. This is where our life experiences, and I think a pastor can say anything about it. If a pastor says, this is my current understanding of this text, I think he can say anything he thinks. But if he says, this is what God said, woo, there's, there's a higher bar for that one, right? So we can give our opinion, our studied opinion, our prayerful opinion, but what we can't do is say, thus saith the Lord, without having clear scriptural evidence for it. Yes, sir? It was the same question that we got up before. So. How, do we, how do we bring it from that day into this? Uh, I guess one of the things that I struggle with is this application. And this is where I think the creativity of the pastor... Um, I used to so enjoyed Adrian Rogers preaching because he had such a gift of alliterating things, didn't he? I mean, it just all these words started the same and sound. I don't have that gift, right? So thank God he had that gift, but I can't make that the pattern for me, right? So the pattern for me has to be, can I express what the original author was saying to his day? I paid the price to know that. Now I have to put that in things that my generation, my part of the country, my language, my world will understand. Yes, sir. I would have Well, no, my question is something, not, nothing deep. Oh, no, it's nothing deep or anything like that. All I'm interested in is you, you were mentioning about the study Bibles. Yes. And you were recommended just the NIV, the others were... NASB, too. Oh, NASB. Because, you know, sometimes when we're studying, or I'm, when I'm studying, in other words, I'm looking at study Bibles, and unfortunately, you just hit something because I don't have that Bible. <laughs> so that's what I was wondering about. Yeah, let me talk about that a minute. Yes. I think that what every pastor ought to have, they ought to have one good study Bible, right? Now, what, what bothers me is that much of, of the church's understanding of the second coming has come from the C.I. Schofield Reference Bible and Study Bible because that's what your parents used and the prophetic conferences across America 100 years ago. Well, but that's one person's opinion and one denominational approach. So we can't say that the Schofield Study Bible is the only understanding of these texts, right? So I often recommend that pastors get two different Bibles from two different translation theories. The NIV is what we call a dynamic equivalent. And the NASB is a word for word. So if there's 10 Hebrew words, NASB wants 10 English words. But these guys say it's not important how many words, but that I catch the concept from the original and put it in a way that my people can understand. NIV is on an 8th grade reading level, which is the reading level for American adults across the board, right? So it's easy to read. So I show preachers, when you compare these two, and there's a word problem, a, a translation difference, you know that's where you've got to look deeper. It's either a textual problem, it's a word problem, or it's a theology problem. And so when they disagree, without knowing Greek and Hebrew, you know that's where I've got to go to get some more help. So I would say get one of each kind, but the footnotes in the NIV, it's the, it's the older NIV, not the new one, the older one, the translators who struggle with how to translate the text, they wrote the footnotes, right? And so it's not so much denominational as textual. And while I'm on that, I want to make one more recommendation to you. A book as a Bible student that has helped me is from the American Bible Society, and it's called A Translator's Guide to... And then they have a one for every book of the Bible, old and new. A translator's guide to. It has nothing to do with theology. What it says is, here's a genitive phrase. How could we understand it? Here's a certain kind of verb. What are the possibilities? So suddenly, because I'm not a super grammarian. I didn't, my school didn't teach me all that. I suddenly know what are the options for me. Grammatically, what are the options? In a neutral setting. So those little books, they're not very expensive. You can get them used online. 
translator's guide to Ephesians, John, Deuteronomy. I think you'll really be blessed by that. Thank you. Okay, there you go. Perfect. I, I would take an issue with a couple of points because I love you, so don't get mad. If somebody told me, do I understand the Bible from Leviticus or John? I got to pick John, right? So just because Leviticus is in the Bible, I can't let somebody proof text Leviticus to me, right? I've got to know that if I love Jesus, I've got to start with John, not Deuteronomy. So first of all, Jesus is Lord of Scripture. The New Testament has to interpret the Old, right? So, and that, so when I, I do a lot of evangelism overseas, when we have a person trust Christ, I say to them, you need to find a church that believes the Bible, right? You need to start praying just the way you talk to your best friend. And you need to start reading John so you'll understand who Jesus is. Romans so you'll understand Christianity. And 1 John so you'll know how to live. So my one thing is I can tell you're a loving Christian person. But you would be a Christian mother who would say to their children, this is what I understand the Bible to be. But I would say to you, you've got to teach your children how to find it for themselves. Because just because you're sincere and you tell them what you know, you're not authoritative. we got to come back to this, right? So yes, we do share. And I, what I found is that the Holy Spirit bends over backwards to seekers and new believers, right? They do crazy stuff with the Bible and the Spirit blesses it. But those in this room, you are not seekers and you are not new Christians. And what a new Christian could do to the Bible, you cannot do, particularly after you've heard this today. You're not going to sell somebody I didn't know. I, I, in some ways, I have not done you a favor. Because I, if you're responsible for the, author, or the original author's intent now when you think about the Bible, right? So... It's a serious thing, and the Bible's important, but it takes years and years of study, and we're all changing as we learn more, right? The problem is that most Christians in America know five proof texts they have never looked up themselves that they got from pastor, favorite preacher on TV, mother, uh, denomination, five texts, and they base their whole understanding on those five texts. And when you challenge them, they have no clue. The kids that come to ETBU, when I talk to them, I think they're wonderful Christians that understand the Bible. And when I say to them, can you show me in the Bible where you got that? Which means what they're doing is parroting what they've heard at church or at home. Now that may be good until they get in the secular world. And suddenly their world's going to be rocked. So we've got to prepare people to study the Bible, not agree with what we think the Bible says. Does that make sense to you? Amen.